My name's Bruce Eats. I'm a, I was in Vietnam as a Marine rifleman in 1967 and 68. I was born and raised in Charlottesville, Virginia. Went to Lane High School. Uh, it was CHS in 74. It was called CHS when they built the new one. But yeah, I, I was local. We were all young in Vietnam. We were at 18, 19 years old, most of us. Very few of us had families. There were some that did. Uh, of course, back in that day, people did get married young, but uh, I, was, I was single. I was very fortunate that I was single. I came from a large family. I was the oldest of six children, so they didn't miss me too much. My family supported me uh, going. I was a draftee. I was drafted in, into the Army, and before I had to report, I went down to the Marine recruiter and said, you know, I'm going to Vietnam, I know that. I think I want to get the Marine training, so I went to the Marines. I was in Northern I Corps around uh, the DMZ most of the time. I had two job assignments primarily. Uh, my first primary MOS was 0311, uh, Marine Rifleman. Basically, all Marines are riflemen to start with, and some of them stay riflemen, but then others are trained for other MOSs. I qualified for language school, so I went to Defense Language Institute in Monterey, California, took Vietnamese for about four months, eight hours a day with a two-hour lab at night, and I learned Vietnamese pretty well, enough to get by. And so when I went to Vietnam, I was an interpreter rifleman. I was a scout, uh, is what they called us. The war in Vietnam, it was halfway around the world, and they were telling us about the domino theory they, of communism taking over the whole world, and they keep one country, then the next country, then the next country. They call it the domino theory, and we were sent to Vietnam to stop the spread of communism because these folks were free, and we wanted to keep them free. Um, we wanted democracy around the world, and we still uh, fight for that today. We fight for what we believe in, which is a democratic, we believe in freedom. But we found out that we can't on everyone, and it takes a, a commitment that you have to stay there. You can't, you can't leave them because then if you leave them in unarmed, then, then in the end, even though you defeat them while you're there for 10 years, you can walk out and they'll walk in after that. In the next couple of years, if you don't give them support, these young democracies will not survive. I think surprising, the first thing that surprises you when you get off that plane in Vietnam is you feel like you're in an oven. It was this, this tremendous heat of being halfway around the world, close to the equator, you know. So, and also the jungles, uh, the, the rain, the constant rain. So the climate surprised me. Uh, I had learned the customs in language school, so I wasn't so surprised by the customs. I talked to the village chiefs, and uh, I tried talking to anybody that would talk to me because I wanted to practice my language skills and see if they really worked. And I really liked the Vietnamese people. They were very energetic people. They had been at war for a thousand years, yet they still got up every day and, and went out with a smile on their face, and I couldn't understand that. You know? Well, before, I was a lot more ideological. You know, I thought, I believed everything our government told me, um, like the domino theory. Uh, actually found out when I got over there that the real reason that everybody was fighting over Vietnam for a thousand years was because it's the breadbasket of Asia. It had the perfect climate to grow rice and any other crop you wanted to grow. So um, they had rubber plantations. They, they had everything there. And uh, the real reason that everybody wanted South Vietnam was because of its ability to feed the whole Asian part of the world. No, the United States wanted to, to keep it free not take it from them, but keep keep the other countries from taking it over. Have it controlled by the Vietnamese. Now, of course, our com country, our companies would go over there, and um, they they're actually over there today drilling for oil and things of that nature. But they're paying for it. And the one thing about the United States is we never fought for territory. We only ever took enough territory to bury our dead. Like in France, cemeteries. That's it. We 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 liberated France, right, from Germany, but we didn't take any of France territory. We gave it to the French. We tried to liberate 
liberate Vietnam. We wanted to give it back to the Vietnamese instead of the other folks. The hard thing was, uh, I was a Vietnamese interpreter, so the hardest thing for me was interrogating prisoners. We didn't use the same techniques that the uh, Orientals used. We we couldn't get a lot of information out of them because we couldn't use any, any kind of harmful techniques. <clears throat> we could only ask them questions. Now, I'm sure they were intimidated, but uh, we never heard them. Um, we sent them back to the POW compound where the uh, Korean Marines were there to take care of them and watch after them. They got a lot more information out of them than I did. But yeah, that was the hardest job I had. But uh, it, it also, we did get some information that ended up saving a lot of lives. So, yeah, I knew that my tour was going to be 13 months. We all went over as individuals and came back as individuals. Didn't go over as a unit like they do today. Today they go over as a unit and come back as a unit. The Marines spend seven months over in the combat zone and they'll come back for seven months. Uh, to, back then you went as an individual for 13 months. Most didn't, didn't survive the 13 months. They came back wounded or whatever. I was fortunate I never got wounded. I, there, there was a VA uh, education bill that paid for my college when I got back. So that was one benefit. If you survived Vietnam, you could go to college. And uh, it was only 400 a month, but that I was able to, to with uh, two part-time jobs, I was able to get through college. Well, as soon as I got back, I got married to a girl that lived about a block from me. She was younger than me, but I'd seen her playing at the park, <clears throat> and I liked her, and then she could dance real well. Uh, so we met, we met again at a club called the Sip and Sizzle, which was in Charlottesville. <laughs> and she sizzled a lot, so I married her. Yes. We had three children, and we're still married after 45 years. So I'm very, very fortunate. I got three children, one foster child, and uh, let's see, nine grandchildren and two great-grandchildren. Uh, I had daughters. I had three daughters, but their husbands served, and I uh, had a lot of relatives that served. Uh, actually, my uncle served. He was an athletic director at uh, CHS. His name was Joe Bingler. Uh, that's my uncle. And uh, in our family, we had 22 people to serve. Our family has most everybody, all the males in our family just about served. And it's kind of a a uh, thing you just, uh, uh, you're kind of expected to do, I guess. The veterans you talked to today, probably 80% of them said they would, wouldn't change anything. They'd go do it again. They would do the same thing. I'm, I feel the same way. I think it, it made me see things a lot differently. It changed my life. I had a very successful life. I'm 67 now. I've been retired for almost five years. So I, I can't complain, you know. Uh, it gave me a lot of uh, insight into how to, to survive in the world. They, you know, I learned a lot about uh, guns and artillery and, and uh, things, and they don't, they don't translate into jobs. And there's no jobs that really translate from what I did, but I learned about people. I learned how to be a leader of men. And so when I came home, I started my own company. I couldn't get a job. Jobs, you couldn't find a job making $5 an hour. You couldn't get anything. And I had a, I, I all of a sudden had a wife and a baby. Find, so I started my own company uh, with steel. I, I, I learned how to weld, and I started putting up steel buildings. I had a crane. I bought a crane, and uh, I financed everything uh, through the banks. And... Uh, so I learned how to lead men, and I had I had like five crews. So that's, they taught me leadership ability. That's the biggest thing I took away from Marine Corps. How did it affect me? It affected me a lot because uh, war is so ugly, you want to forget it. And how do you forget things? You turn to drugs or alcohol. So when we got back, most of us turned to one or the other. I turned to some alcohol and tried to... Uh, drown my memories of Vietnam and I'll, uh, I haven't had a beer in, in 26 years now but I drank too much uh, beer to try to forget and I got scared that I'd run over somebody drinking so I quit I was fortunate but uh, yeah it, it definitely has an effect on you people have PTSD 
uh, from the bombs and the artillery and, and things going off around you, uh, it does definitely have an effect on you. Back then, they didn't call it traumatic brain injury. They didn't call it that. When you got explosions around you, um, it, it affects your brain a little bit. And uh, so, my wife thinks I got brain damage, but I don't. I don't agree. There's 22 veterans every day that commit suicide, wow. every day, because they come back from war and they can't get their life back together. They've had multiple deployments to war and their family's all broken up. They don't communicate well with their wife or their children and they're still in the war zone in their head. And so they become hopeless and, uh, like I said, 22 a day are committing suicide. We're, we're trying to do programs to help them. That's why we have this museum here is to teach people about Vietnam teach them the bad parts about Vietnam too, and teach them how it affected the soldiers in Vietnam and it's affecting the soldiers today. And we have lots of programs that we work, we volunteer to help the returning Afghanistan veterans today so they can adjust because we learned a lot of lessons. Um, we feel like the Vietnam veterans were treated very poorly when they came back um, by our country. They turned their back on us. They ridiculed us and uh, spit on us called us baby killers. We never killed any babies. We, If anything, we gave them food. But uh, the way the country treated us, we said never again will any veterans come home from war and be treated like we were treated. They're all volunteers, you know, today. Mm -hmm. So that's why we do everything we can to help these veterans that are coming back now. There's nothing glorious about war. Uh, it's, it's a necessary evil is what I call it because We've been at war now for, what, 12 years straight with Iraq and Afghanistan and the other wars that are going on right now, so we don't really have a choice about it. Um, I don't feel like I had any choice. Even uh, You can talk to the Vietnamese. There's many, many Vietnamese in the United States that fled Vietnam, and they still appreciate the fact that we tried to keep their freedom. Uh, Veterans Day, there's a guy that owns a Vietnamese restaurant locally here. He brings us a big thing of food every Veterans Day up here to the museum and tells us thank you for fighting for our food. Now, we don't fight for, for land. We fight for freedom. And I still believe in that today, even though it seems to be uh, a lofty goal for our country. But I still believe that freedom is worth fighting for.